Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending today. My name is Jamie Peddle, and these are my colleagues, Andy Cabtruck and Sarah Ruth. We are three parents with children who have autism. Sarah left Canada with her family and went to the U.S. to seek medically necessary autism treatment for her son. I live in Brampton, Ontario. I am a single father of four children. The youngest is a seven-year-old boy with severe autism who needs medically necessary autism treatment. The treatment is intensive behavior intervention therapy based on principles of applied behavior analysis, commonly known as ABA. The medical and scientific communities have long recognized that ABA is the only effective treatment, evidence-based treatment for autism. Studies and experience have demonstrated that ABA can have a huge impact on the development of children who are diagnosed with autism. Until the cause and cure of autism are discovered or a more effective treatment is found, ABA is the core health care need of children diagnosed with autism. It has long passed that our, both our federal and provincial governments recognize that autism is a neurological disorder that without treatment can have a profound negative effects on the individual, the family, and their community. Many provinces have initiated ABA programs under their Ministry of Social Services. These programs are often plagued with unconscionable waiting lists, discriminatory age cutoffs, and are simply inadequate in the amount of treatment provided. Because of ABA is not covered of Medicare, the cost of providing medically necessary treatment has often fallen to the parents and families of those affected across our country. The consequences are that many of, of the children are not receiving treatment because of their families, inability to pay. This is not only un-Canadian, it is immoral. The solution is to have ABA universal accessible and covered under Medicare. This means our federal government must get involved. This is no longer just a provincial issue. The federal government must work together with the provinces to move autism treatment to where it properly belongs under the provincial ministries of health, include ABA in each provinces, the list of insured services, and provide adequate funding to the provinces to cover the cost of treatment. Back in March 17, 2016, our own Prime Minister had said, and I quote him, how we care for the most vulnerable in our society is very important. A couple months later, over 2,200 Liberal Party delegates to the Liberal Party of Canada's National Convention in 2016 overwhelmingly voted for this solution, overwhelmingly passing this resolution, making it the priority health care resolution at that convention. This resolution clearly lays out the roadmap of how to solve this issue. So what has the federal government done since 2016? Nothing. And that's why I'm speaking out. In 2007, the Senate of Canada issued a report called Pay Now or Pay Later. Autism Families in Crisis, among other recommendations, this report calls for the federal government to provide treatment funding. It's 2019, and, this, and the crisis has only deepened. There are over 500,000 Canadians diagnosed with autism, 1.5% of the population. The incidence rate is 1 in 66 children. The problem is getting worse. Untreated or inadequately treated people will cost provincial governments a massive amount of money for long-term care. By comparison, treatment is relatively inexpensive. In closing, I am calling on the Prime Minister and the leaders of all parties to recognize this is a health care crisis. We need whoever wins this election to act immediately by doing as this resolution instructs. He must put into motion the necessary mechanism within the federal and provincial governments to make ABA and IBI universal accessible and covered under Medicare. This health care discrimination against Canadians with autism must end now. Canadians are dying in, in need of medical treatment 
and our country is failing us. We need Medicare for autism now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Kafchak. Thank you for coming to our press conference. We are here to ask the federal political parties to put an end to the discrimination in Medicare against Canadians with autism. This is a grievance which has existed for the past two decades since the Auten case was first litigated in British Columbia and brought to the Supreme Court of Canada in 2004. ABA is evidence-based treatment which can have a huge impact on children diagnosed with autism. Multiple studies since the 1980s have demonstrated repeatedly that when provided early enough and intensely enough, Almost half of the children diagnosed with autism can progress in their development to the point of being able to enter the school system at the average level. That, for any parent of a child diagnosed, who's severely di diagnosed with severe autism, that is the dream and the goal. We have in Canada a Medicare public health insurance system which is supposed to provide all Canadians with their core health care needs. ABA treatment is the core health care need of Canadian children who are diagnosed with autism. And unfortunately, this entire class of Canadians have been shut out of Medicare. Those provinces which do offer autism treatment typically assign it to the Ministry of Social Services instead of the Departments of Health and don't cover it with public health insurance. This misplacement of autism treatment programs has a huge negative consequence. Not only do these ministries not have the expertise and the resources to administer health care programs and services, but these programs are treated as expendable social services whose availability is dependent on the goodwill and generosity of the government of the day, instead of being treated as the medically necessary treatments that they are. All of this year's repeated protests by parents in Ontario have been about one issue and one issue only, and that's access to treatment. The autism community looks to every election with hope and prayers, only to be repeatedly and consistently disappointed, and this election is no different. The Greens and the Liberals have issued platforms that don't even contain the word autism in them. The NDP and now the Conservatives have issued promises which make reference to a national autism strategy. The NDP say they will work with Canadians living with autism to develop and implement a national autism strategy, while the Conservatives say they will make an investment of 50 million over five years, which would be invested to develop a strategy. Thus, one uh, promises to develop and implement, the other one just to develop. Neither of these mention treatment, access to treatment, or Medicare. And while the NDP's promise gives no idea of timelines, the Conservative promise suggests that we will, it'll take at least five years before we find out what that strategy may consist of. Such promises are obviously totally unsatisfactory. There is no action plan to help the autism community today, tomorrow, or after tomorrow. The promise to start listening to us, if elected, is a painful recognition that for the past 20 years we've been talking to the wall. In this me the middle of this Canadian federal election, two fascinating things were reported from the, our neighbors south of the border. On October 1st, President Trump, yes, President Trump signed the Autism Collaboration, Accountability, Research, Education and Support Act, which would result in U.S. $1.8 billion, that's Canadian $2.4 billion, over five years for a number of things, including treatment. And second, it has now been reported that with the adoption of new rules in the last holdout state of Tennessee, all 50 U.S. states now have some level of mandated health insurance coverage for the treatment of autism. With respect to the issue of jurisdiction and precedence, after the election of tw in 2015, the Liberal government passed a bill which legally obligated the Federal Minister of Health to work with her provincial counterparts to develop and implement a national autism or national dementia strategy that would improve the lives of Canadians with dementia and the federal budget contained the corresponding financial resources to support such a strategy. What this demonstrates is that where there is the political will, there is a way. 
And a central core pillar of any national autism strategy must be the taking of steps to ensure the inclusion of autism treatment under Medicare. What we expect from our federal government is to convene a meeting with the provinces, to demonstrate some leadership, to put some money on the table, to provide corresponding incentives, and negotiate the inclusion of autism treatment under Medicare from coast to coast pursuant to national standards. We are not asking for the moon. We're only asking to be treated as are all other Canadians under Medicare. We need Medicare for autism now. Les familles touchées par l'autisme souhaitent que les traitements d'intervention comportementale intensive soient administrés par le ministère de la Santé et payés par le système public d'assurance maladie. La discrimination doit cesser. Nous avons besoin d'un leadership fédéral prêt à des grands pas et pas des petits pas. Ce que nous attendons de, ce, de notre gouvernement fédéral, c'est d'organiser une réunion avec les provinces, de faire preuve de leadership, de mettre de l'argent sur la table, de fournir des incitatifs correspondants et de négocier l'inclusion du traitement de l'autisme dans les services couverts par l'assurance maladie pour toutes les provinces d'un océan à l'autre, conformément aux normes nationales. Merci. And now, sir. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Ruth, and I'm a proud Canadian born and raised in Niagara Falls, Ontario. I'm currently living in New York State and would love nothing more than to move my family back home. But I can't do that. The reasons we moved to the U.S. are no longer a factor in our lives. But a move home for us would be to destroy all of the hard work that has gone into my autistic son Zachary's treatment thus far. He would lose all of his speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and when I say speech therapy, I mean five days a week of speech therapy. He would lose access to his special education services and supports as we know them. He would be thrown into a general education class at nine years old and left to sink or swim, while his teacher with 25 other students would struggle to support him and his needs. Currently, he's in a class with only five other students, a master's level special education teacher, and a classroom aide. And up until the end of last school year, he had his own one-to-one -one aide as well. Despite his limited speech, Zach can read, write, answer comprehension questions, and do math equations. His artistic skills are incredible, and he has absolutely no negative behaviors such as aggression to others or self-harming. I live in a country where the state of our health care is a travesty, but what we do have, at least in New York State, is access to services and supports and treatment that have seen Zachary learn and grow and thrive as an autistic child. 85% of the funding for Zach's therapy comes from the U.S. federal government. However, that money is distributed to the individual states and left for them to apply appropriately. The problem is most states don't mandate or fund autism services the way New York State does. This is why we're calling on the Canadian federal government to implement a nationally mandated Medicare strategy for autism in Canada. Why does the United States, well, rather, why does New York State invest over 100000 a year into my son's treatment? Because statistically speaking, it will ultimately cost the government and the taxpayers two-thirds less over his lifetime. $100,000 a year from age 2 to 21 sounds like a lot until you do the math on what it costs to house an autistic adult in a group home or treatment facility from young adulthood until they're senior citizens. The longer Canada waits to put a national policy in place to serve children like Zachary, the more difficult and costly it will become, while more and more future hopes and dreams of these children and families diminish. We know that not all ch autistic children grow to become independent. Many will still need some level of support in adulthood. But with the way things stand now, no one has a chance. Unless you remortgage your home or you dump your kid on the government's doorstep, sign your rights away. And even that's a terrible option because what child would thrive when their family completely abandons them? Every child in this country, regardless of their abilities or disabilities, or whether they are rich or poor, deserves the chance to become the very best of themselves. We as a nation are failing our most vulnerable, and as, for a country as amazing as Canada, it's shameful. We as a country cannot afford to wait any longer to do something. To the folks out there who believe that these are our children and this is our problem alone, I have news for you. It will be your problem. Parents age. We get sick. We die. Where do these young people go then? Into taxpayer-funded programs, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. At this point, we have two options. Start building group homes en masse, 
or start helping these kids now. We need Medicare for autism now. Thank you so much. So at this point, we're available for any questions. You've heard from the different groups, as you said, the conservatives are promising $50 million over the next five years. I think maybe $100 million over four. The liberals haven't committed any money yet. Um, is there a golden number in terms of what you're I looking for? I need the for bathroom. For the, for the need that's there? Okay, let's be clear. What those funds are is for the development of a strategy. We're, we're, we're seeking beyond that. We, we want the action plan. We've been telling them what we want for, for decades since the Otten case went to the Supreme Court. It's been on the national agenda. So, you know, the, this is a very strange phenomenon because when the conservatives, for example, clearly say we will spend $50 million to develop a strategy, they don't have a strategy. There is no strategy. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> what they have is, is a strategy to develop a strategy, but how much does it cost to make a phone call for consultation purposes and to send emails, to do a survey and to hold meetings in government offices. I mean, $50 million over 50, five years just sounds like an astronomical amount for just doing consultations to develop a strategy. We, we don't understand why they won't present right now the pillars of a strategy and make a commitment to negotiate with the provinces as we've asked the inclusion of Medicare in, in, in uh, autism treatment in Medicare from coast to coast. I'm, I'm sorry? You've been reassured that there's, a, there's no treatment of part of those numbers that have been promised? Well, the, uh, have you seen the, the wording of what they've actually promised? Because the wording, the wording of the press release that they issued said, an initial investment of $50 million over five years would be invested to develop a comprehensive strategy in consultation with autistic individuals, autistic organizations, provincial, territorial, municipal governments, indigenous communities. There's no strategy. I mean, they, they're not spending $50 million on anything else, or at least if they are, they're not saying what it is. And that's, that's the problem. That's what we're asking for. I mean, I printed out the entire press release here, and I've looked through it several times. I'm trying to find out what are they committing to, and all I can tell is that they're going to spend $50 million on doing consultations to develop a strategy. They don't say what the strategy is. Does that answer your question? Sure. Um, can I also ask, um, you talked about the provinces and some are not, you know, better than others. Is there a province in Canada that is kind of, you can look to and say, yeah, they're doing things right? Yeah, well, on that point, this is interesting. You know, across Canada, when the Senate committee in 2007 was looking at funding for autism treatment. The Library of Parliament Research Branch did a study and issued a study indicating across the board what, what's happening in every province. And that study was updated by Autism Canada just a few months ago. And as you look across it, what they list all the programs here in all the different provinces, the vast majority are offered by the Departments of Social Services and they're not covered by Medicare. There are a few, like for example, Nova Scotia, where it says it's the, uh, the program is administered by the Ministry of Health and uh, Health and Wellness, or something like that. Health and um, just a second, it's health. And the thing is that my recollection, when they started their autism program there, access. I'm not sure it was covered under Medicare because access was entirely based on a lottery, a lottery. And there was a news report that went across, um, you know, the country a couple of years ago where the one plastic surgeon in Nova Scotia who had a waiting list of a thousand people who needed plastic surgery to deal with their burn accidents and so on, his son was autistic and he was moving because he didn't win the lottery. He was moving to Manitoba to get access in Manitoba where he was told he wouldn't have to wait as long in line and would be able to get access for his son without without going through Medicare and without uh, going through a lottery system. And that's abandoned in, in, in Nova Scotia until they found a replacement plastic surgeon. So the situation in every province is disastrous. But for years, 
we know that Canadians, many for, have moved from province to province where they thought in another province the situation's better. For years, the destination of choice was Alberta. And we know of one facility that apparently in Winnipeg, like this surgeon from Nova Scotia went to, that's supposed to be very good. But generally speaking, across the board, we don't have Medicare coverage, and we certainly don't have it in Ontario. Here, CHEO is one of the regional service providers, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario for the Ministry of Social Services. And this year, when the Ford government changed their funding formula, the uh, CHEO issued uh, news reports that were reported in the Ottawa Citizen and so on, that now you have to present your credit card not your health card, and the fees were $3,000 a week. Well, that adds up to $150,000 a year. Who can afford that? You know, so we need Medicare for autism now, and we need it now, not in five years, absolutely. Uh, hi, uh, could you just tell me uh, who's responsible for organizing the uh, rally that's coming up this afternoon? Both of us. Both of us. Both of, us. Both of you? Yeah. yeah, we're just parents of autistic children who have watched with tremendous disappointment the evolution of Canadian public policy, provincial and federal, with respect to, to autism matters. And we're not part of any organization. We've created our own committee of concerned parents for autism for Medicare now, autism treatment for Medicare. Uh, you know, we, don't, we, we don't understand some of these organizations. Frankly, after the Conservatives, for example, issued their, their statement, saying they're going to spend 50 million over five years to develop a strategy with no, no, no components. Uh, you know, if you take a look on social media and the Twitter universe, the heads of some, you know, provincial charities, societies of autism are thanking, uh, uh, you know, the conservatives for a, for a strategy. Where is it? And another national alliance is tweeting you know, that they're so glad they have support for a national strategy. Well, where, where's the strategy? I mean, we've got to wait five more years. If this is a minority government, there's going to be one, at least one, maybe even more elections before that five-year period is up. And who knows if the same people are going to be around and are going to be willing to implement whatever it is they finally decide on. So this is wholly unsatisfactory. And um, uh, where are you from and uh, how many children do you have? Well, I'm from Ottawa. I have two children. My older boy is uh, a university student, perfectly uh, average. My younger boy is 18, and he's severely autistic. He was diagnosed in December of 2003. And in uh, February of 2004, when there was a budget day, I came on Parliament Hill and protested with a couple of parents calling on budget day for the federal government to put some money into autism treatment because we found out very quickly the hard way that we were on waiting lists with no end in sight, no light at the end of the tunnel at all. And so that was February 2004, and I got this tie at that time that says Medicare for Autism Now. And now we're here we are in October of 2019, and I can't believe that our politicians have just been ignoring us consistently at the federal level like this. But for so many other medical issues, I mean, they're practically tripping over themselves trying to outdo each other. When it comes to Medicare, we've got proposals for pharmacare. We've got proposals for dental care, for eye care, but just not autism care. Why? And uh, is there going to be anything else involved in your campaign aside from uh, today's press conference and rally outside? Uh, we're doing a rally at 12 o'clock. Uh, we hope you'll come. We've got some signs. You know. And, uh, yeah, we're going to continue to scream and shout. I mean, that's, you know, this is a democracy, and the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And we've been squeaking for 20 years, and we're going to keep squeaking until our kids and future generations of Canadians who are diagnosed with autism get the, the treatment that they deserve. I'd like to add to that. Yeah, so basically, uh, I, I will say this. I, I'm very uh, disappointed in, in our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, and I'll tell you why. I met him back in Brampton there. He was doing an announcement. And uh, as he was getting off the bus, I gave, him, I gave him this policy resolution. And then he went into the house to make his announcement. And then as he came out of the house, right, I said, Prime Minister, can I ask you a question? You know what he had to say to me? He said, it's a shame, it's a shame that what Doug Ford is doing. 
Now, this is a prime minister who wants to be the prime minister of Canada, and he can't even ask Canadians a question. He can't even answer us a question. You know, this is, this is what his party voted in favor of, you know? And he can't even answer a question about it. He just reflects everything to Doug Ford, which is, is totally uh, not what a prime minister should be uh, about. And, uh, and a lot of things, too, about the Liberal Party. You know, they seem to have a bad case of amnesia or something. Because, you know, back in 2007, they introduced a bill, C-304. There's two key elements to this bill. One was to amend the Canada Health Act, and the other one was for the Federal Minister of Health to come have all the provincial Minister of Health and to no negotiate a deal for medical treatment of autism. The whole Liberal Party voted, for, voted in favour of this bill, except for one MP. 2016, the Liberal Party, over 2,200 delegates, overwhelmingly voted in favour of this across our country. And here we have a Prime Minister saying, it's a Doug Ford issue. This is not what a Prime Minister of Canada is, is, should be in office for. Very, very shameful, very uh, disappointed in someone like this to have the highest office in Canada. He's not worth the vote, that's for sure. Very disappointed. One last question. If Medicare came out for, for ABA treatment, what makes you think that the wait lists would be shorter? It all boils down to resources, doesn't it? And right now, when the ABA programs are offered by the Ministry of Social Services, the budgets are entirely set at the whim of the government who treat it as a discretionary expenditure, right? If it were to be transferred to the Department of Health and covered by Medicare, besides having the current budget that's presumably could be renewed the following year from s the Ministry of Social Services, presumably these autism treatment programs would also have access to funds from the Canada Health Transfer and any health accords and related budgets that are negotiated. If you look at the Green Party, for example, platform, they're proposing negotiating and extending, you know, uh, health accords to include rehabilitation services. And there's no reason why that model can't be used to incorporate also under negotiated health accords autism treatment under Medicare. And with that, there would be federal funding contributing to it. So, you know, I mean, obviously, when you go to the hospital these days and you need surgery, you know, you may not get it tomorrow. <laughs> we all know in Canada there are wait lists for services. But there will be more resources, and the program will not be treated as some sort of discretionary social service that could be expendable. Every time in Ontario, for example, we have a new government and a new minister, there's always changes. It's like they're nickel and diming the program, which absolutely sends families into chaos. And that's why we've had, since February this year, repeated weekly demonstrations in front of the premier and the minister's offices. And I don't see that happening for any other disease, disorder, illness, condition, syndrome that's treated under Medicare, do you? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. See you at 12. Yeah, see you at 12.